Hey, welcome to the uh, Inside Running Podcast, Shoe Geeks episode, oh, I don't even know what number, but June 2021. So I'm joined here by uh, two guys who currently aren't working at the moment. Um, well, Ju- Julian's always working, but uh, how are you going, Julian? Over in Noosa still, I believe? Uh, yeah, mate, up in Noosa. Um, always working, actually, when you own a business. You Both of you would know this. When you work, when you own a business, you're always on 24-7. So uh, just working from home, I guess we'd say, and home at the moment is Noosa while we get ready for Ali's Olympic marathon. That's it. Then you'd be back doing a bit more running now as well, which is good. And uh, not quite as much as running as uh, Tommy, who's uh, sitting over in, uh, I believe, a hotel room or Airbnb in Cairns at the moment. Is that right? Hostel room, yeah. That's right. Hostel. I'm in Cairns. It does look like a hostel room, mate. <laughs> hostel? What the? Tom, yeah, yeah. come on, mate. Hostels. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, Cairns had, like, hardly any accommodation left. Um, mm. School holidays, I think. But, um, no, it's all right. It serves the purpose. I've got my own little cubicle here. So, it's not a what shared dorm. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Like, um, you had a pretty uh, abrupt exit uh, out of New South Wales a couple of weeks ago, or maybe a week ago. And... Um, plan was always to go away before Gold Coast Marathon and uh, how'd you get there? Yeah, I was going to come up here on the 22nd, but um, when things started to look a bit shady with cases of COVID in in New South Wales and potential closures with with the borders, um, Lana, my wife Lana shipped me off early. She's like, nah, just she she wanted me to race and she was happy for me to leave her and the kids a little bit sooner. So yeah, I I jumped up here um, a bit earlier and I spent a few nights on Gold Coast and then, uh, yeah, just came up here just for, there was some some others training up here. So Philo and um, uh, Michael Roger and Jerry Clifford and um, also um, the group from, from Perth, front, front runner group. So Nick Harmon, who's doing the half marathon. So a good, good group of guys to train with up here and get a bit of heat before the race. I thought Nick was doing the full marathon. No, nah, he's doing the half. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think he's he's planning on doing a marathon um, possibly later in the year. Yeah. How's the training going? Yeah, good. I can't complain. Um, I'm getting the recovery, so the training seems pretty manageable at the moment. It's almost like it's almost hard because you know we're coming into the taper now that um, want to do more than I probably should. I got the time, and um, yeah, so I just got to try and hold myself back. To be honest. Um, so what are you doing with yeah. the extra time, Tommy? What's that? What are you doing with the extra time? Yeah, work stuff, mate. So fair enough. Um, yeah, just uh, business. Um, and uh, hold on a sec. <laughs> uh, yeah, business stuff. A uh, little bit of telehealth stuff, website yep. stuff. Yep. yep, sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very good. So I'm you, you, be- oh, sorry. You you go. You been you been running a bit more, Nita? Yeah, I'm back. I'm back about 60Ks a week at the moment and I've uh, been back for about maybe six weeks. And that's 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 it's moderate volume for me, to be honest. Like my high volume is getting out to 90 to 110. So I'm three quarter of the way there and I'm pretty well pain free. And like, I've rotated between so many different shoes in 60Ks per week. You think that'd be, you know, two shoes worth. But um, I have gone through a lot of new shoes that I need to talk about today. So get into it then. Have a good. crack. Well, um, first of all, I've just just in terms of most of my work's been easy running, but I've actually had a couple of the performance shoes. And the one thing I'll say is, when you review shoes, you, you have to wear them for their purpose. Like I, you know, when I was sore and niggly, like I was only jogging in return, and I was wearing a few super shoes for return. Like I had like the Meta Speed Sky, and I was wearing it for jogging. And you, you just can't you, you can't assess a shoe if <laughs> like a fast shoe for jogging. It just doesn't work that way. So. I've had a couple of sessions in a couple of good shoes and uh, I'll start with the volume shoes and I've actually got a sample through here as well. So this is um, this is the new Kayano 28, which Julian, you might be able to tell me it may be released. I'm not sure. No, not yet. It's very soon though, July release for this one. Yeah, um, so you can see we've been waiting still, on it for a while. They still stick with the Duo Max, but it's really, um, it's, a, it's a much more compliant foam on the medial side. It's a relatively full contact zone um, outsole. It's pretty flexible through the forefoot. They use their forefoot blast. And um, this shoe, 
I mean, I don't off, I haven't worn the counter for so long because it's just been a bit of an irrelevant shoe um, for me personally. And I think while it sells probably seventy percent of ASIC sales in the running the running field, the shoe um, has become quite soft in the forefoot um, and still relatively soft in the rear foot as well. It's a bit weighty. It still has a traditional ASICs feel, but it's um it's not firm and it makes no noise on the ground. And I think because it's got no external trussics, it's all built in within the midsole. You can sort of see. On the medial side, you got a little bit of like softer plastic on the medial column, but um, so it's been actually a relatively enjoyable shoe. And um, I know my colleague here, Matty Clark, has been running pretty well. He's been wearing this for a lot of his jogging at the moment, and um, he's a very four foot orientated runner. So I reckon he said it's probably going to wear a bit quicker than the average Kano would historically, um, being a bit softer. But with you know, that's the compromise. You put a softer shoe on your foot, it's going to wear quicker. I mean, I think it's a small price to pay for a bit more enjoyable run. So. So, uh, Nito, is... just explain why the old Kianos weren't relevant for you. Uh, you know, when I, when I, I mean, I still don't jog fast. I jog between 4.30 and 5-minute K pace and, you know, but mixed between dirt and pavement. I put a Kiano on and it sort of weighed about 310 grams. Um, it was relatively firm underfoot. Um, it, was, it, was, it was quite a, I don't know how to say, it was bottom heavy. It was a, quite a clunky shoe on my foot. And it wasn't enjoyable to run in. Um, I don't even know how else to say it. It just it hit the ground. It made an ordinary noise. Uh, it didn't return any enjoyment to me whatsoever. Um, and I think it was just because the foams were quite firm. They were quite old EVA, very traditional. Um, but I never liked them. I never liked them even when I was like, you know, 14, 15, 16, when I had pairs of them in the GT2000. So Whereas this is the first time I put on a shoe and it feels like the foams would have been more in their enjoyable shoes. So like, uh, you know, the Nova Blast, for example, it's not as much foam, but it still feels a bit more enjoyable like that. So, um, yeah, just just not a mileage shoe that I've ever been interested in. And obviously they sell really well. Otherwise, they wouldn't be made in bulk like they are. But I don't know if you guys have been wearing, you probably when you first started, Jill, and you started off playing footy, so you probably wore the Kano as a normal shoe. So. <laughs> Absolutely, mate. I was I went to the athlete's foot and they told me that I needed a $200 shoe. I looked at the wall and saw that the Kano was $260 and I said, surely that one's better. And the guy's <laughs> like, oh, yeah, let's try that one. And mm -hmm. I put it on and then I was like, yeah, this, is, this feels more expensive. It must be better. Mm -hmm. And then I looked up at the gel Kinsai. And uh, I'm like, that one's 20 bucks more. Can I have that one instead? That one must be better. Um, I, I had a state league netballer come in the other day, <laughs> a lovely lady, and uh, she went with the uh, gel Quantum. Oh, and, Quantum, uh, okay. Yeah. The Quantum's the one that has, like, you know, the keen side, had all the gel and just the rear. Yeah, yeah. It. It went, the Quantum goes all the way through the midsole, so. Keen side was about 600 grams each shoe, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, but it's funny. I think people might listen to this podcast and hear us all, all talking about the new update feels nicer, feels better, smoother, all these things. And I think if we did this podcast five years ago, we actually wouldn't be saying, like, we wouldn't be having as much good feedback, especially around the ASICs range where the update was like one seam here, a little bit of stitching Absolutely. there. Now they're actually turning their range on their head, which is why there's so much like, positivity from our reviews on these shoes because Absolutely. they are like very much changing things um yeah and, and and while i'm at it like this is the sample shoe that they sent me uh thoracics for the clinic here and this is the new gt 2000 the 10th version you can see the color coding it's softer forefoot through here it hasn't got the forefoot blast but it uses the flight foam through the whole forefoot this is a shoe that has a great contact area on the bottom now They've removed the uh, the duo max in the medial column. They use this little system called um, oh, it's called like light trust, and um, there's no plastic within this shoe. I, I mean, it, it, we'll go into a question later on and talk about about orthoses and fitting them into shoes. But this almost has the platform of like a you know a, a, an 880 or a, a dose for mind as well, and it's a really stable looking shoe. But for, for, it's fun under the forefoot, so. These two shoes are the ones I tend to have gravitated away from the past couple of years. And funnily enough, that in 2021, they've probably been the best two updates, I think, in their normal range. Yeah. Mm. I reckon for me, from looking, without actually trying them on, they look yeah. like um, one big change is that removal of the uh, plastic or at least the exposed plastic. So in the Kayano, still having a bit of that shank in there, but 
being covered by the foam. So you're not actually, because I had I had run, I had a lot of runners come in, particularly like midfoot, sort of forefoot striking runners that um, you can see the plastic just being shredded um, mm. even well before the outsole was was uh, uh, sort of worn through. So that I think that feeling for me of like clunky clunkiness. Yeah. Um, probably came a lot from that that plastic ex- exposed plastic shank um, that just made it yeah stiff and slappy. Absolutely, and uh, dare I say, historically Mizuno have done something similar as well. Um, I haven't worn their new range for a while, so um, it just has been a nice update from from their shoe and and just to keep on the Asics as well. Like I I received the new Nova Blast two and. Um, I think uh, both of you guys might have tried it. Definitely, Tommy, you've tried it. And um, yeah. I'm not sure if we chatted about it last time, but um, I haven't got the sample here, so I'm hoping... Oh, yeah, actually, you don't have it either, Tommy, do you? So, no. um, but essentially, it's it's not as soft as the previous version. It uses the same foam as the um, the Nova Blast one, but the design of the midsole, what they've done is um, they've essentially, where it should be... Uh, it's hard to get the camera right, isn't it? Where it should be... Um, uh, sort of concave in the medial part of the column, so the foam does compress side to side or from top to bottom. They filled it in, so it's much more foam on the lateral and the medial column um, where the concaves were. So it feels firmer to me. Um, it still feels soft under forefoot, but um, I think maybe uh, it was a really unique shoe, the Nova Blast one, and I really enjoyed it for a change, especially for easy days and, and even picking the pace up. But this um, feels a little bit more stable, which I think. I guess you would argue works for more of the population um, and it runs off eight mil drop, not 10. Uh, everyone knows my opinion on pitch. I like to have a high pitch in a shoe. So, um, but it feels a bit firmer. So I think while the shoe's not a dramatic change, it's probably become a little bit less enjoyable for me personally, but might work for more of the population. Um, so the yeah. moment last move. I'd agree with that. Like, I think personally, I don't like the update as much because it's, it's sort of closer to the other shoes I've got in my rotation. Like I was saying to you guys before, I think it's almost like heading towards more of like the glide ride feels. Yep. A little bit firmer underfoot, a little bit more stable. Um, but yeah, I think it will suit probably a broader population, particularly with people that felt the original was a bit unstable. This is just yep. going to feel better. That That's exactly me. That's like, you guys don't seem to have like outlier or <laughs> more extreme mechanics like I do that like I pronate quite heavily. Um, so for me, the cut out the concave walls of the midsole just used to crush down and I used to just fall off the shoe, especially towards the back of the run when I'm more landing through my rear foot or going downhill. And I used to, I wear shoes out really quickly, so I felt that it got sloppy pretty quick. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the new changes. I think they're gonna. It's gonna mean that I can wear it more often, slower days, and um, uh, I can just feel more stable in it. Yeah. And I finally, after a, a year of owning them, I finally got to uh, to actually do a, a hard effort in the um, the Alpha Fly and the Kipchoge mm. version for that matter as well. And uh, I haven't done um, anything besides strides. Yeah, once again, I think it's fair to note that you do strides in a shoe. It's different to doing a full workout in them. And we did like a 20-minute workout. that was four minutes on, two-minute jog, um, a couple of times around. And I was able to run with the, the, the juniors I coach and run at about the 310 to 320 pace. And that, that's my shoe, I think, for racing anything from 10K and above uh, the Alpha Fly. Like, I think I hit the sweet spot off the, the pods. Um, it feels relatively stable. Um, maybe maybe the upper is probably a little bit more, um, you know, you lose a bit of um, feeling on top of the midsole when you're going around a corner. But, uh, you know, the shoe felt really economical for me. I reckon I was, uh, I'm not in, not in shape to run the 310, 320 pace already, but that shoe seems to just push me there a little bit quicker. So, um, and for the first time in a while, I woke up, didn't have sore calves in my first workout on, on the bitumen. So, it's a really, really nice shoe. Um, I know it doesn't work for everyone compared to the Vaporfly, but um, for me, that just felt like uh, the money ball. So. Have I told you guys that I finally got a pair? I oh, know. <laughs> you did tell us. I was surprised. I thought you must have won the lottery or something. Uh, yeah, I had to do it. Everyone was just, just poking me too much about it. So uh, <laughs> yep, yep, I'm, not gonna be able to, I'm not going to be able to try it out before, the, before Gold Coast. Um, so I'll, I'll use the vapor fly for Goldie, but um, yeah. maybe the next one. Maybe the next one. Give it a go. And the last one I want to talk about, I've uh, lucky enough to 
uh, receive a pair of the Adios Pro 2 from uh, Chris Chapman from the running company in Adelaide. And, and I was a lot of hype at this shoe. Um, and I, I, I guess I can't be completely honest with it. I've only done 10 minutes of like moderate work, work in the shoe. Um, the one thing worth noting is that it looks really good. It feels really good in the hands. Um, it's meant to run off about 10 mil heel pitch, I believe. And uh, But when you place it on, um, it is... It has large various attributes to the shoe. What I mean by that is, you know, how like the New Balance um, Rebel or the New Balance uh, RC Elite 2 have like a large lateral flare on the shoe. This has like a slight medial flare on the shoe from the rear foot all the way through to the forefoot. And the first thing I noticed is, is that you sit quite, um, this camera's annoying, you sit quite various. So you're sort of at a slight tilt. So yeah, I felt more pressure under toe one and toe two from the um, in the forefoot. And I felt like I was toe towing off a little bit off the outside part of the foot, not straight through the big toe because of it. And uh, I've had a couple of ankle sprains in my time. I think maybe I've got a bit of a laxer ankle. So whether it was just exposed more on me, the, 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 the grip, the outsole, and uh, felt fantastic when it was on the bitumen. But it, and the rocker is really late in that shoe. I reckon the rocker is as late and pronounced as the, the Meta Speed Sky, maybe maybe more because the shoe is probably a bit firmer through the midsole. Um, so it's extremely stiff. So I, I need to try it out for a longer workout to get, um, but it did feel quite polarized compared to the feeling of the Alpha Fly, I must say. So um, I'm not sure who it could potentially works for. Maybe a foot that is a bit more pronated, someone who does, you don't want them to fall into Valgus too much. Um, but it is a unique design. Having concave on the lateral side and having a medial flare makes it like a, you know, uh, two points to make it feel very inverted. Yeah. So, so oh, yeah, go, mate. Sorry, I'll, I'll just ask you what shoe it compares most to, what super shoe you would compare it to. Because the question here, a lot of people love comparisons. So, um, yeah. softer or firmer than Vaporfly, faster or slower than. The other shoes in the range. I personally found it if you if you you know walk in it in the rear foot, it feels soft. But when you run in it, you don't normally hit that part of the shoe quite as much as pace. I find so it felt much firmer than the Vaporfly foam um, than the Peebacks. Uh, it feels much firmer. It still feels firmer than the Asics uh, um, Meta Speed Sky as well, which you know I think feels firmer than the um, uh, firmer and more stable than the Vaporfly as well. So. I think the rocker is comparative to the MetaSpeed Sky, um, just purely because it's quite late in the shoe. Um, but that various attribute of going into the shoe is what makes it feel a bit more foreign to me. It's nothing comparative I've had in a racing shoe. I know Adidas historically, when they used to put their supernova mileage range, they always sort of had various attributes using that. Remember that triplanar pod at the back of the rear foot? You know, when they had the yeah, supernova yeah. there. Yeah, so it, yeah, it has that sort of feel to it, but going all the way through to the forefoot. I reckon if it was in the rear foot and they kept the forefoot like you know more perpendicular, I reckon the shoe would probably work better for more population. But you know how like people run and they hit the ground at that sort of various angle? It accommodates the entry into the ground pretty well for that sort of gait, I reckon. So, um, but I can't compare it to the first model. I'm assuming it's as close to the first model as possible, but they didn't really hit the shores of Australia that well in mass anyway, so I've never got to try the first model. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so, so people that have prone heavily. heavily. Potentially, like yes. Yeah. Well, I don't fall out the lateral part of the shoe very often, and funnily enough, standing in the shoe and running in it, I felt like I was falling off the midsole laterally uh, in the forefoot. What, what do you reckon about the um, energy rods? Do, do you feel like they feel different to a carbon plate or same? Yeah. Same sort of uh, I, I think it's I think it's confounded by the midsole feeling firmer. It's really hard to tell. Like I would say the rods feel firmer, but maybe the light strike foam is just firmer. Um, so it's it's tough to separate them. I mean, the shoe feels stiff, right? So uh, when I did laps on the grass, you know, just to try it out, it just felt far too stiff and firm for that environment. Whereas I think I can sort of put on a um, you know really soft foam and still feel um, you know quite some return of energy on the on the grass. This one here, I couldn't do it. It needed the road. Uh, for one, for grip, but to to try and compress that foam as much as I could. Yeah. All right, Tommy. Um, I'll just do my week quickly because, or my month, because our listener question kind of comes off your answer as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, the shoes that I've been running in haven't changed because I've still been away since our last episode. And I haven't had any new ones sent up here. Um, so for me, just coming off the Achilles niggle. 
found that shoes that with a, uh, what I've noticed is those shoes with a less aggressive heel cup have been a lot nicer um, because like after all the dramas, we sort of found out that it was more sheath inflammation um, of the Achilles. Nidra, you had it right from the very start. After we did all the <laughs> all the scanning and all the diagnosis, you actually nailed it. But um, and and if if I've got a heel cup pressing on the tendon, it was actually aggravating a little bit. So the the New Balance More V3 is still the best heel cup out of anything for that Achilles. I love it. It sort of peels away like an elf kind of heel. Um, it's also a little bit broader back there. So that's been really nice and. Um, being this is another all right this is a weird one I've been in the gym a bit so doing weights and uh, being on the elliptical trainer now you would think it doesn't really matter what shoes you need on the elliptical but when you start sweating they get really slippery on the paddle so it helps to have shoes with good grip <laughs> the best shoe so far has been the Adidas Boston with the continental rubber on the outer sole gives you the best grip on the elliptical paddle. Um, you must be a but, very tall on the elliptical walker in a pair of Boston's. <laughs> I was thinking that I should one day whip out the Alpha Fly and do an elliptical session, see if it improves my performance or not. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, no, I've just been rolling around in the Invincible as well, the Nike Invincible, because there's so much concrete in Queensland. The Invincible feels amazing up here. Just gets a little unstable after a while for me, I like everyday shoes, just a little bit wobbly underfoot, which is where the more comes in, probably similar softness, just a lot more stable. And, and uh, just so on that, the Invincible, I, that's, I've been wearing the Invincible more than any other, other shoe right now for volume, and I've been wearing on trails, on bitumen, and, and maybe, just maybe, that's why the Adidas Pro felt so firm as well, because I've been running mm. in that shoe so often, every other shoe started to feel a little bit too firm for me. So. Um, but that, without a doubt, with the surface area of it, I don't find the shoe completely unstable, even on the trail. So it does work, and I have enjoyed that shoe more than any other volume shoe I have in the past decade, I'd say. What? For more sure. than Epic React? Pardon? More than Epic React? Yeah. Yep, oh, absolutely. Geez. Yeah. Right. Yep. yep. Like in the front. Oh, there you go. Mm. All right, Tommy. So if you were going to go on a training trip... And you could only take three shoes, which you have done. Mm -hmm. What are the three shoes you're taking? Um, so I've got the, um, I took, so yeah, I brought with me the Structure 23s. Um, the, more, so the more I wear these, the more I, I do really feel like they are what I want a Pegasus to be. Right. They're just like, they're just, they're pretty well cushioned. They're pretty stable and they got like a real nice um plush upper so it's just like a, it's just like a workhorse shoe it's it's yeah. just nothing special nothing fancy you know don't, you don't get the the invincible crazy softness it's yeah. kind of like moderately cushioned um but like stable and without being rigid or slappy um, do you have them with you to show us yeah yeah so these these okay. guys yeah yeah cool um, yeah, they, so, they, so may I ask Julian quickly, are they easy to sell in store, the, the structure? Yeah, they're very easy because yep. they're so stable and they're really cushioned and they fit a lot of feet and they're $200. Mm. That's, that, <laughs> that, that's points. the dream shoe. Yeah, mm. a shoe that feels good, is stable, soft enough, broad enough and isn't going to break the bank. Like you were right, Tommy, that's a Pegasus. That's what it should mm. be. And there's no like crazy geometry. It's like pretty just stock standard traditional geometry. Um, no like big cutaways or anything that makes it feel um, like over overcorrected laterally or anything either. So, um, like I was I was coming off the back of as well off some plantar fascia pain. So I just I wanted a relatively stable shoe. Like I could have brought um, Invincibles, but they're just not as stable. So I reckon I would have been at risk there of just pissing off my Achilles or my um, plantar fascia with it. What um, sort of so mileage do you reckon you'll get from the structure? I reckon pretty good. Like, I, I, yeah, it's literally just the only shoe I've got here. I'm, I'm like walking around <laughs> in it when I'm not running in it. So it's getting a real, it's getting pounded. And I hate doing that. I hate walking in um, in my running oh, yeah. shoes that I'm actually currently running in. Um, 
that's not probably cool. something to do with the the foam not being like marshmallow soft so it doesn't feel like it's ever bottoming out um and also the, the zoom air unit i think you know obviously that's one element of the cushioning that doesn't really wear out so it always feels like there's that element of the cushioning that's in the shoe that doesn't change from the start of the run to the end of the run or even at the end of the day when i've been walking mm. in it all day um i reckon it's going to be like real durable um mm. yeah good even though it's not like react foam it's just eva it just feels like it's going to be pretty durable, sort of um, probably get at least, I don't know, I'll probably get at least 700K out of it, I reckon. Nice. Yeah. All right, so um, yeah, that's, that's your easy shoe. So easy, long run, everything that's not a session. So my, I decided to bring up the um, Metaspeed Sky for sessions just because I'm actually really enjoying that shoe um, and just saving that. So the third shoe I brought is the Vaporfly for race day. So... I'm not actually using that shoe till Goldie. Um, but yeah, the Metaspeed Sky. So um, I've done quite a few sessions in it now. Um, perception hasn't changed that much. Um, like probably from the beginning, it felt pretty good. Like I thought it was a pretty close competitor to the Vaporfly. Yeah, like you're saying, it's not quite as soft. Yeah. Um, so I actually prefer it. Like I see it as maybe for me, if I was going to use it as a racing shoe, probably shorter distances, like 10K road. Because it does feel like um, y you want to get up on the forefoot more on it. There's a lot of forefoot cushioning in it. It's obviously the lower drop than the vapor fly, so it's almost like it wants to get you up on the forefoot. Um, yep. It does have a lot of forefoot cush. Um, yeah, so the sort of sessions I've been doing in them have been in, within the, in the taper now have been shorter anyway. I haven't done a long marathon session in it, just the shorter sort of closer to um, threshold or v VO2 max sort of um, pace. So... Um, yeah, have you have really, you added a hill hill pitch to it as well, or? Yeah, yeah. So I got I got nine mil hill lift in it. Yeah, you got nine yeah. mil lift in it as well. Yeah, yeah, nine mil. I have to. I have to. <laughs> otherwise, it just it does crank too much load in my Achilles. So, yeah, um, yeah. Yep. That's that's the little hill wedge. Sh you show us your hill wedge. I see, I see you put multi form on top of that. What's that? that show us the hill pitch up close. I see yeah, you put multi form so on it as well. A little uh, a little soft. <laughs> A little bit of cushion on my heel. So this goes on onto the top. It's, it's a bit softer. Yeah, it's a soft. It's like a real mm. soft EVA that I glued on top of the wedge, which is like a medium density EVA. So for the fat pad, it likes a little bit of that extra softness. Um, but you can see, like it's yeah. um yeah, like the forefoot compared to the rear foot. It's just so I just chuck chuck that. Oh geez, what am I doing? Mm. Chuck that in yeah. there, yeah. and yeah, brings it up. Um, I, I wore it for a track session as well. So I've done all road except one track that was on a synthetic track up here in Cairns. And it felt real good. Like it felt good on the track. Um, whereas well, I, I, I reckon it felt. I have words from Clarky that it looked really good. You were making 250s look really, really good. <laughs> I love that pump up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it did feel good. Um, probably felt better on the track because I've done like I've done some track sessions and races in the vapor flies and I honestly kind of felt at that pace it felt better yep. um just poppier and yeah um and obviously I, I probably yeah. would have wore dragonflies maybe if um if I had them but this is a does it why all would you wear rotation, spikes right? when you're only like <laughs> why would you wear spikes 10 days out from a marathon I know. Preparing for next year's uh, track myself. season. I know. That's a terrible decision. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I actually, I agree with you. I agree with you. I know. I, I just, I just love the feeling of them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I say, so you've you've taken three up to up to, on your training trip. One of them's mm -hmm. a training shoe, which you you mean you're running sort of what 150k a week, six hundred and sixty. So you're cutting out yeah. a bit, Jules. Oh yeah. No. Is that me? Yeah. 150, 60. Mm. Oh yeah, sorry. Getting one shoe for that. And then what's your third shoe? Because you've t you've already busted out the super shoe. Surely you've haven't taken two racing shoes up. Yeah. So the third is just the vapor fly for race day. Mm. <laughs> That's it. I think you've frozen again, mate. And you won't touch the third one. What's that? Um, you've only taken two shoes up, really. Yeah, pretty much. 
just hand luggage, mate. I was just uh, trying to pack light. Made the made the call last minute. Just threw them in. Hand happy, luggage happy with your choices. Hostel. Hand this luggage, is how the, this is how the favourite for the Gold Coast Marathon lives right now. Oh, settle down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Scott. Oh, yeah, I'm moving into the, uh, the QT. <laughs> right? mm. Can't wait. Living the dream. So, Joel, mm. Joel. Yeah. All right. So, you could Julian, pick the shoe and would you take, What three shoes if you could take? Same trip, what would you do? Same trip. All right. Alpha Fly. That's my race shoe, session shoe. Um, it's good for my, good for my legs. I, I prefer it over nearly every other super shoe. So I've got um, Alpha. Um, second shoe would be Invincible. Love it on the concrete. Super spongy, um, fun shoe. And I think the third shoe would be the New Balance More right now, Maximal shoe. Just a real easy day, um, like cruiser. So that's pretty easy for me. So much fun. <laughs> I reckon um, I'd pick. I'd take the invincible. That's why. I would, oh, I would. All fun. <laughs> all fun. Uh, invincible is a workhorse. Uh, I'd probably take the Endorphin Pro from Sokoni as my session shoe. Uh, I still think it's a little bit more versatile for uh, for me in terms of I like it to be. I like the, the slightly firmer feeling for a session if it's going to be slightly shorter, uh, but it's soft enough for a longer run as well. Um, if I need to pick up the pace. I still prefer a little bit over the ASICs at this point in time, but I haven't worn the ASICs enough. That's my job this week is to try and do a couple of sessions with that. And the I'd race in the Alpha Fly now, I think. Um, I've only done one workout for 21 minutes, but I'm pretty well convinced perceptually that was the Jeez. shoe that I'd wear for a race. Mm. Cool. Mm. Nice. You're on board. Absolutely. So, which I, you know, it's been a while. I've had that shoe sitting there for a long time and I was a bit cynical of it. Like, um, I didn't think, you know, Tommy's words were, oh, I don't think I'm going to get a pair because I don't think I'll be a responder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still not convinced. I'm going to hold that comment. <laughs> ah, fair enough. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> uh, another question we had from uh, a listener who was actually at the clinic through here. He had a question on sort of... Um, using orthotic therapy in different shoe geometries and whether they still remain to be placed into neutral shoes only. And I thought this would be a good question for both Julian and Tom because you would probably get most of your referrals from podiatrists more than likely, Julian. And Tom, you are a podiatrist. So to answer that, and that the follow-on question is also in relation to racing shoes and the use of orthoses as well. You know, are they useful? Are they worth doing? Um, and if they are, do some race shoe geometries work better than others? You go. Mm. Uh, Interesting. Go so, yeah, I guess back when we started, back when I started working in shoes, there was a real, real differential between a neutral shoe and a support shoe. So the neutral shoe um, was obviously the same density the whole way around. There wasn't soft crash pads. The foams were all quite firm. So they were all pretty stable, I guess, and the support shoes were all very strong. So you would have a very hard um, medial posting. So like off the top of my head, I'm thinking shoes like Brooks Adrenaline, Kayano, shoes like the Trance and the Mizuno, Nirvana, um, basically shoes like that had a really strong wedge. So there was it put you at risk of overcorrection if you didn't require that support because uh, we used to see shoes coming in the clinic. Oh, not the, well, you would see shoes coming in the clinic. We saw them coming in the store where uh, the, the shoe had been smashed laterally and they would come in and they were just sitting on the outside of their feet. And then you would pull, the, pull out their inner sole and it, it turns out it was an orthotic and the, um, and the, the orthotic had almost been, well, it had been pushing them laterally in the shoe and directing all the load onto the outside of the shoe. The medial post will never wear out. It's just too dense to ever wear out um, or compress. And the soft foam on the lateral side of the shoe in a support shoe would compress at a much quicker rate. And so you're getting two sort of factors that mean the outside crushes before the inside. Um, so we would use neutral shoes then and because of the firmness of the foams, you would get a better rate of wear and the, the foot would be in a more stable position 
depending on how strong the orthotic is and depending on the on the uh, mechanics of the the wearer um, so we're assuming the orthotic is almost, is a, is an orthotic that uh, works I guess I'm not sure how you podiatrists put it but almost works to correct the foot back into a position that we would consider neutral where it would um, it would guide the foot from strong or um, heavy version back up to a more neutral position if you took footage from a frontal plane where they were towing off without it being in a position of sort of pronation or supination. Um, now, not all orthotics are like that. So uh, occasionally we would see orthotic come in that was very, very strong. And no matter, even if you put them in a neutral shoe, it would still put them in that um, various position, like you were saying about the Adios Pro Nitter. It would sort of push them out, even in the most stable neutral shoe, they were still getting almost forced into position of supination. Uh, so you would you would always struggle with that because their shoes would always wear out and they would always feel quite unstable in it, but it wasn't a footwear thing, it was an orthotic thing. Um, these days, the way that the shoes are made, it's very rare that we see overcorrection from the support shoes. So if you look at the ASICS support shoes, the dual density post is quite fine. If you cut the shoe open, the, the posting is only like, I'm not sure exactly how far, but it's only a slither of posting on the medial side. So what they kind of, how they kind of talk about it is the support's there if you need it late in a run, if your form breaks down, if um, you start to have more of a rear foot strike that's, and you start pronating more, that's when you actually use a little bit more of that firmness and the shoe, as it degrades, keeps a bit more rigidity to it. So that's not going to put someone in a position of overcorrection like it used to when the posts were a lot stronger and thicker and ran into the shoe more. So these days, we're not as worried about putting orthotics in support shoes. We still normally start with a neutral shoe um, to get a gauge on how strong the orthotic is. We might take some footage of the, the customer running in the neutral shoe. Um, if it looks like we could do with a little more strength, then we'll use a little bit more support from a shoe. Uh, if none of the neutral shoes fit the orthotic or accommodate it too well, then we'll move into support shoes to provide a few more options as well. Because a lot of the time the support shoe might be a little bit wider through the midfoot, have a little bit more depth through the um, toe box as well. So if the shoe's more comfortable for the wearer, we're going to get a better result regardless of if it's neutral or support. Yeah, that's nailed that basically. I mean, that's what I've been saying as well. The the categories are changing, um, or not the categories, but all well, the categories are there. Sort of, it's getting a bit um, uh, blurry. The lines between mm. stability and neutral, aren't they? Um, well, I mean, I think, that's I think it's not simple. A bit of an example was like I talked about that sort of the new GT two thousand that's um, going to be released exact and. A, a common stable neutral shoe that's probably been sold in specialty retail from the ASICs has been the Gel Pursue. Um, mm -hmm. And I would look at this GT2000, the Pursue, and if I put a shank dependent or non shank dependent orthosis in this shoe, the platform is arguably very similar. And I wouldn't think you'd see a huge influence on the shoe, on the orthosis between those two. Yet categorically, they're slightly different because the categories have become a bit more close. Uh, I would say there's not much difference between them anymore. The only reason I would send someone into a, a GT2000 now is because the flight foam is probably a bit softer and more enjoyable. If someone's a bit heavier, maybe going into the suit because the foam is probably denser and you'll get more durability out of it. And that would be something as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. And nowadays we're seeing shoes that might not, might not be orthotic friendly. So you could mm. imagine some of those super soft shoes like a Nimbus Light or a New Balance 1080 or an Invincible. And if we're using a strong orthotic that yeah. shifts low pretty dramatically into that super soft foam, it becomes very unstable underneath. And you might find yourself falling off the shoe um, really easily. A lot of the knits, the uppers these days are a lot more flexible. And again, if you're, if you're pushing someone laterally and there's like a very loose knit on top, then yeah. the foot might not be contained well enough on top of the midsole. So we have to consider the strength of the uppers now as well um, and also the depth of the shoes so sometimes we're getting shoes that come in again the 1080 is a good example where 
it's not a tongue, it's just a booty design. And so yeah. you put an orthotic in and you don't have much flexibility above the top of the foot because there's no tongue that can go up or down. And um, a lot of people find like too much pressure if they're using a device in that shoe. And that 1080 is a great example. I mean, even the heel counter itself, while it's contoured and shaped the way, as you said before, like the, uh, the New Balance More 3, there's not as much space in that heel counter as you think when you add a posting with an orthosis with a bit of a heel pitch to it. Um, you, you know, you're, you're a long way off the ground at that point in time because it's got a fairly high pitch at the rear anyway. And uh, the room for error, the sliding and the comfort of the upper and the orthosis is sometimes, well, there's too much complexity going on there. That's why the 880 became such a solid shoe to accommodate an orthosis yeah. because there's more volume in the shoe. It was more simplistic. The rocker wasn't as pronounced and, and the upper would keep you just, you know, compact so what the orthosis was probably doing is is probably what it was designed to whereas you imagine you're, you're lifting someone up on top of a higher platform you're shifting you're higher up the ground there's more moment arm influence so if something's slightly inverted it might become largely inverted than what you expected it to be yeah good so tommy just um how like obviously send them down to the running company ballarat but if they can't make it there um, how would you how do you guide someone into the right shoe for their device like what cues do you want them to feel when they put their orthotic in how should they feel do you want them to feel their orthotic or do you want it to feel like it's part of the shoe how, how is it what what cues do you give um, a lot of orthotics that I'm doing uh, pre-made um, so they're coming to the clinic with an injury, um, and on the spot, and that, uh, anyone that's coming with a running injury, I encourage them to bring in their running shoes, not just one pair. Like if they've got multiple pairs, bring them in. So I bring their, their rotation often a bag with, with quite a few. And, um, often I'm just using a foam. So these, these are called shank dependent. They're just foam. They stay, they rest on the, uh, contours of the shoe. And I'll, I'll um, adjust it according to their injury. So if they've got a particular site that needs offloading, I'll wedge it wherever I need to wedge it. It may be tilted. It may be, sometimes it's actually trying to pronate the foot more to offload a structure um, as opposed to the stock standard anti-pronatory mm -hmm. ones. But um, I'll put it in the shoes and, and essentially, if it's a painful condition, I almost want them to feel like it's deloading and reducing pain, reducing their symptoms in the clinic straight away. So I know we're like, we're heading in the right direction. The classic one would be like plantar heel pain. What I tell them is I expect them to feel more pressure through the arch. And what'll, what that'll do is actually then de unload the, the plantar heel pressure where they're having their plantar heel pain. Um, and, you know, that's probably a good outcome is pushing, pushing some of the load elsewhere while still being relatively comfortable. So it's a bit of a... You know, they may not know. They're like, yeah, I feel the pressure there. But, you know, until they go away and start running in it, they won't probably fully know whether it's going to be a 100% a, a comfortable device um, despite the fact that it's offloading something painful. And that's where reviews are super important. So um, if someone's not getting used to a device, I just get them to come back in. We chat about what it is, adjust it, and, and refit. Um, and in that scenario, you know, once their pain subsides, their injury sort of improving with whatever other um, rehab we have in place, they will probably just go back to their standard insole um, after that point in time. So then they can, uh, I just get them to basically pop their orthotic in the cupboard for when and if they need it again. Um, if the similar injury props up the same injury, they can use it again. Um, so that's, yeah, you know, but when it comes to someone that's an orthotic user and it's like the long-term thing, um, they just got to go into the store and try the device. So if they've been using it for a while, they kind of know what it's, what they're used to, what it feels like. And so when they put it into a new shoe, it shouldn't feel all of a sudden dramatically different. So if they're normally in, for example, like the, uh, the, eight, the New Balance 880, that's a tradi traditional sort of roomy shoe that accommodates an orthotic and they go put it in a um infinity or an invincible which has like a very like rounded base and it's sort of con it's even got its own sort of like arch support system it's got that plastic clip if they're using like a foam orthotic in that the arch height is going to be totally different in yeah. the orthotic to what the arch height was in a different shoe or if it's a traditional plastic device with a flat heel post that flat heel post is going to be like cutting into the foam 
um, because the foam's like curved and it's got the lowest point center and then it starts curving straight away. So that post is going to start cutting in. Um, so they've got to go try the orthotic. They've got to go see someone. I'm giving you a plug here. I don't want to, but like yourself <laughs> that um, knows, knows that stuff. They're like, whoa, you've got this sort of device. It's probably don't even bother trying. If, if this is the device that you need to use and it's worked for you in the past, we've got to try a different shoe off the bat. We can't, we can't try this shoe. Or if you want, if you want this shoe, go chat to your podiatrist. Do you still need this orthotic or do you not need the orthotic? Like not enough people re review with their podiatrist. Like I send out reviews. I still don't get, like some people don't come back and review with me. And I'm like, we need, you need to review because you may not need the device or you may need a different device. You may need less mm -hmm. corrective and may need more corrective or, or not at all. It's like, it's an evolving thing. It's not just like, here's an orthotic, use this for five, 10 years um, because your yeah. mechanics are this and they're always going to be this. Um, it's not I mean, that simple. You can't shut up before you're using it like a shoe to, you know, like anything as well as to try and deload a tissue and get them to keep running, aren't you? And, you know, once that tissue heals, a lot of the time you should be gravitating back to, you know, what was happening before you were getting injured. You should be able to sustain running without it, hopefully. And there aren't too many cases where you need them long term as well. Like I find, you know, 2020 to 21, we've had heaps of stiff rocker sold forefoot shoes. So people who've had big toe pain and, and plantar plate injuries under the second, third capsules, you could just modify the sock liner, put a U pad there and put them into the stiff rocker sold shoe. And that usually is enough to offload. You'd argue that's the most orthomechanical or orthotic-like treatment um, these days, whereas we didn't have those options as much maybe, you know, a decade ago. So, um, and, you know, like you mentioned, is that if you've got people who have shank-dependent orthotics, the faux ones and non-shank ones, that they're highly influenced by the shapes and contours within the shoe as well. And every now and then shoes change. You know, I remember the, the dyad used to be like the most stable shoe and I would argue now that you put a posted orthosis, it does invert a little bit more now. People do come back in and that shoe is not, you know, it's, maybe it's a bit softer without an orthosis than what, than what it used to be. And then you put an orthosis in, it can gravitate. And you don't want people perceptually feeling like they're falling out of the shoe. Um, that's not comfortable for anyone. So, um, you know, you almost err on the side of caution where you're a bit less orthotic because we've got a bit more shoe a lot of the time. So what do you reckon, Nitter, about the orthotic racing shoe? Uh, that's a tough racing. one. Like, I mean, the whole idea of racing is to be economical, isn't it? And so less shoe is normally better uh, when it comes to weight. But we also know now that when you have a higher stack shoe with nice, soft, lightweight foams, that, that's, that seems to be the performance that you're searching for from 5K onwards or 3K onwards. And if you put something mechanically in there and the shoe is quite compliant, um, the orthosis can slightly, well, probably la more so influence how you hit the ground. If you hit the ground slightly in varus or inverted, it probably means you stay there for longer. Um, it promotes it a bit more. Um, I still have some people that wear traditional base racing flats where I think orthosis fit in too nice and they stiffen the shoe up to, be, to some extent through the rear foot and the forefoot towards the forefoot. But um, there aren't many cases in right now where I'd say you'd put an orthotic device into a high stack racing flat with a benefit that is going to reduce a symptom and, and, and enhance your performance because of that. So I can't think of too many scenarios unless I'd be more inclined to modify the internal sock liner of a shoe more than likely if I need to do anything. The problem, though, is not like, let's use Nike, they're the biggest race shoe out there. You can't take their inner sole out now. Um, Absolutely. Oh, well, you can. You, just gotta, glued in. You, can, yeah, you can get them out, but you see, it's just, you know, yeah. the patients don't like, like that, you know, seeing a $300 shoe, you just pull their inner sole out in front of them. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, we often have them, people come in the store and want to use their orthotic in a race shoe that they might use once every three or four weeks. Um, and we, I try, like, they're very attached to their devices, so they, they think that if they go for one run without their device, then the world's going to end um, and their foot's going to fall off. So it's hard to sort of convince them maybe not to worry as much if you're only using the shoe for one run every three or four weeks maybe. Um, maybe if they're using it three times a week, that's when you want to be worried or, or that's when you can chat about it. But if you're using it once a month, um, maybe you could you could sort of get away without your device and you will enjoy the shoe a lot more. You'll enjoy Absolutely. the shoe so much more <laughs> and, and it will fit better. Like mm. putting a device in those race shoes with how narrow their lasts are and the heel cups, which are just 
almost non-existent. They're they're just like just um, almost just bits of fabric now, rather than any plastic or or anything to hold the foot in. It's it, it's very rare to be able to fit a prop like a strong device in a shoe like that. So yeah, it's definitely harder. Like I remember uh, working with Jess Tringo before Glasgow, and we ended up. Uh, Glasgow Com Games, we ended up putting like a really thin, intrinsically posted carbon fiber plate that just contoured the shape of her foot when she'd get to 30k. She was getting a lot of tibialis anterior and posterior symptoms. And that was just enough to deload um, during the marathon and racing. But keep in mind, she wasn't wearing a Meta Sky Speed, Meta Speed Sky back then. She was wearing like a, a Hyperspeed. And, mm. uh, you know, there was a fair bit of volume in those shoes for how much, like, how much little shoe they truly were. And so that probably made the shoe arguably more comfortable to some extent for her. That's why she was able to run better. But, you know, maybe in a Metaspe- Metaspeed Sky now as well, there's so much substance that the properties of stiffness come within the midsole of the shoe. Maybe that's what can, you know, deload those tissues a little bit without having external support as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Reckon you nailed it, fellas. Very good. Cool. So what's the plan? So just, uh, Tommy, you, you've just got a nervous couple of days to hope the world stays the same so you get an opportunity to show us what you're made of yeah i'm not um yeah i'm trying to think about it too much it's hard when i got yep. um trying to keep myself busy not overthinking yep. things because i mean yeah it the race could be called off at any point if there's a even if there's a few more cases in queensland so we'll see I'll keep training like it's happening absolutely when That's when good. do you get up when do you guys uh get up julian uh thursday we head down from Noosa Thursday. Mm. And uh, how's how's Elle feeling? She's um she's enjoying her RC Elite twos, and she's gonna have a big. Well, she had a really big workout on the weekend, so she's going to this half marathon a little bit. Uh, what, just a week taper, a few day taper, baby, basically. A week taper, yeah, seven mm. days between. Probably one of the biggest workouts you would ever do in a yeah. training block. Um, what was the what was the workout? Ah, uh, it was. 7K, 6K, 5K, 4K marathon effort with 2K, 1.5, 1K floats. Um, So it was a big workout. But when you're trying to fit races into a marathon block, you you just have to find spots for these workouts. And seven days before the race is about as good as you'll get, (laughs) even though you're probably not fully recovered by seven days' time after a workout like that. You, no. you got it. Like, there's one race that's a lot more important than the others in this block, and yeah. um, and that's that's the Olympics. So maybe the Gold Coast will suffer, but I don't think so. I think like mm. I think she'll be okay. Yep, that's exciting. Yeah. And uh, any, any new shoes coming Tommy. up on the way? I'm interested to hear what Tommy says about the Alpha Fly when we speak to him next. If he gets an opportunity to wear them, so For sure. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I need to run the, some trails when I get back. I got this pair of trail shoes from Asics. <laughs> oh, is that the tribu- the new Tribuco or is it? Uh... I gave that to the wrong bloke. <laughs> or was it no, the high stack? It's, it's called Fuji Light. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. It, no, no, it's not the high stack. It's a, it's a mm. pretty nimble sort of feeling shoe. Um, it, it's kind of like a um, – the density of the foam feels like a Nimbus Light. It's soft. It's yep. like it's like a road yep. shoe with big trail lugs. It looks it's, nice. it feels fun. I reckon it makes it's going to make me want to go on the trails. It's like a, a soft. Or I find the trail shoes too firm for the most part with that with that sort of stack height. So it's uh, yeah, Absolutely. find some trails maybe. Cool. Yeah, very good. All right. Well, I think that wraps it up for this uh, episode. So best of luck, uh, Tommy, this weekend, and also to Jules, who's coaching. Thanks. So, mate. Uh, and good luck at the uh, the live podcast if hopefully it all goes ahead. Yeah, thanks, mate. Cool. Yes. See you next month. All right. We'll do, guys. All right. See you, guys. Bye. See you.